Good evening, friends, enemies, and unacquainted strangers. I welcome you to the disquiet library. I am the curator, and these listless halls house many stories and artworks. This evening, I have a reading from the library collections. Unfortunately, there is no associated artwork with tonight's piece due to the nature of the material described. But before we get to that, I had a few announcements. Patrons may have noticed a few mysterious figures in the library of late. I wanted to say that you do not need to be concerned. These are merely the assistants who have responded to the job request I offered last month. Their large metal claws and gas masks are merely the protective equipment I had on hand. I expect that I will have one selected soon. In the meantime, I did some work with organizing the children's fiction section of the library. Of course, I soon lost it amongst the stacks, but for our younger patrons, stories should be more accessible to find. Oh, and I have created supplies of paper, crayons, and compasses at the front desk. I request that anyone who would like to help the library with mapping efforts use these to document their travels. Your maps can be returned to the front desk when you leave. It appears the author has included a further note that they would wish me to read before I continue with the story. This work is intended to draw off the concepts of how AI art is terrifying and draw off the concepts of the uncanny valley. The author does not intend to represent natural human conditions such as conjoined birth or portray and villainize neurodivergence as concepts of changelings have been wont to do. If you are particularly affected by unreality, please skip this episode. And with that, let's begin. The angry buzz of the neon lights against the grey backdrop of the city pressed in on one's surroundings. Even here, off the beaten path, away from most of the bustle and noise of the squares and market front, there were too many people for one's liking. Amidst the drizzling rain reflecting off of the dull, flat walls of glass and metal stretching up into the sky, a figure walked. They had their windbreaker bundled around them, one hand holding the once bright red hood up to prevent it from falling back. They checked their phone. If the message was to be believed, it would be around here somewhere. They passed a few sodden boxes and some piles of plastic bottles and sheets of coupons and advertisements which had been blown into the gutters and now tried desperately to clog the drains. Ah, there it was. A small staircase dropping down into the pavement, lending access to a nondescript glass door, merely giving access to the basement of this building. There was no sign dictating its duty. There was not even the seemingly all-present signs dictating the name of the place. No, it was merely a door. There were some numbers printed on the glass beside the door, simply the short three numbers decrying the address. It looked perfectly mundane, and the glass was tinted in that dim office building sort of way, where the glass was included because of course it was, but it was designed to look in such a way as to render its purpose unusable and merely show a dark, gloomy state beyond the door, regardless of whether or not there were inhabitants or not. The figure noted the locale, but continued to follow their glowing phone in their hand till they reached a bit beyond the end of the street, where they rejoined the throngs of crowds and stood in front of yet another store, its front aglow with glowing signs and advertisements. The figure shut down their phone, making sure it could not wake. It was probably a foolish endeavor, as companies had other ways, and they could find you if they wanted, but at least it would give them some mental comfort, however small the gesture would be. And besides, their data would be lost in the sea of data at some random server room. They tried not to look at the advertisements, all desperately clawing for a foothold in the psyche. Some small ounce of attention, for attention must be paid. You must be looking somewhere at all times, and that somewhere you are looking could be valuable. It was funny, though, for if one stopped and actually looked and paid true attention, they would notice the strange things that did not belong, the hands that were not hands, the eyes that held strange edges, and how the people were too perfect to be human. But to look and pay attention it would mean that you run the risk of those insidious tendrils occupying your mind guiding your hands the next time you're at the store to draw out from you the precious few extra bills needed for food or medicine into buying gum, chocolate, anything at all. It didn't matter what it was. All that mattered is that attention was paid and that you were lost, and both of these are intentional. When the figure returned and pushed their way inside the strange, gloomy door, they found nothing but an empty, gloomy office hallway, 
seemingly entirely nondescript. Yet when they took any one of the doors, they might notice a distinct difference in the air. It was subtle as the earthen tones were still diluted by the stale office air, but the scent was unmistakable to those who knew. Books? Finally something that felt truly real. The space was not as grand as the libraries of old, and indeed many of the bookshelves had been created out of ramshackle hybrids of old desks and metal filing cabinets. In a desperate attempt to use limited finances and sheer willpower to wrestle some of the usability back from these unnatural plastics and forms of the modern day, they passed the small table requesting donations. They checked their pockets, but just as always they found no coin they could offer. Everyone gave what they could, which even then added up to scant little, often enough, not even enough to keep the lights on. The figure gave a guilty wince as they trundled off to a corner where once again they would take advantage of the safety and reprieve of the space while knowing they could do nothing to aid its continued existence. After shaking and stamping their clothes off on a grungy threadbare and at this point sodden rug, the figure removed their red windbreaker and settled into a flumpy beanbag near the shelf haphazardly yet deliberately labeled fantasy. The character preferred to keep on their stained down coat with patches of duct tape, occasionally letting out white strands of feathers. After gathering their bearings and letting their body truly calm down, the figure took an gl idle glance across the shelves. The books themselves were a strange mixture and amalgamation just as the shelves of the whole establishment. Some were old, thick tomes and printed and truly bound. Many of the torn, stained copies of paperback books that could have been a week or a hundred years old. These mixed in with delicate comics barely held together by their staples, as well as the odd, hefty textbook under which the shelf would sag. Even a few children's books, but the pleasant textures and colors attached to the thick pages had long since fallen away. The character reached along the spines and found a small book bound in green cloth. It looked to be handmade, with the lettering embroidered into the cloth and the whole manner sewn together with a heavy yellow embroidery thread. The book's pages may have been made of cut printer paper and the cover out of an old Amazon box, but it was an earnest attempt by someone who cared, and its flaws lent to its authenticity with realness and intentionality that was hard to come by nowadays. Sure, its titles was misleading. Folk Tales Through the Ages where clearly the author had included stories they had been told, barely remembered, or even ones that they've written, written themselves, distinguishable by the distinct earnestness and harsh notes of someone who wanted to make beauty but had only ever known a harsh life of hard labor. But mixed in and amongst the stories were just genuine recountings of old failed fairy tales, some simple and friendly, others horrifying, and altogether a bit too much gore. But the stories were interesting to read, the stories of elves and dwarves, or of cu curious trickster fey creatures trying to capture the souls of wayward travelers who'd stopped atop their mushroom rings. It was a welcome reprieve. When the character turned one of the pages, only for a pile of objects to fall into their lap, they were not surprised. Humans wanted connection, in a place like this, in and amongst all these stories, in a space far away from the world. It was where people hid their secrets, or left notes for each other, hoping some other wary traveler may enjoy them. And of course, there were several lewd photos or magazine clippings, and a business card labeled Call Me with a heart next to the number. But as the character put the items back, tucking them away for the next traveler, it was the unspoken custom. They saw a note pinned in the same rough, deliberate printing as had been inscribed inside the book. A note. This one seemed much more recent than the book itself, and was written on a post-it note, which still had a bit of tackiness to the beaded black glue. These are not just stories. Listen to what they have to say, for you must pay attention. Details are the details. Look at them in the eyes. Count their teeth. Look at their hands and count their fingers. Check if they have a shadow, and if the shadow is of human form. Are they too perfect? These are not just stories. Stay safe. Attention must be paid. The character was put off kilter. They tried to justify it to themselves as merely some flavor, someone trying to add some interest to the world beyond mere stories. But the strange note sat captured in their mind, 
even as they returned the letter to its place and the book to its shelf, even as they sat in the beanbag trying to muster themselves for the walk home, the note simply was. It existed, it was tangible, and its earnest emphatic hand simply was, where attention had been paid and could not be refunded. They had managed to put the note out of their mind, or at least to the far corners, as they left the underground office in the hallway, and they set their sights on home, a simple meal and some rest. After an hour, the rain had washed away and blurred the memory. Perhaps they'd just fallen asleep. The character veered off the bright main thoroughfares and into a different set of winding side streets that denoted them nearing their journey's end. They bumped into an odd young woman. She was sitting atop the dumpster, her yellow raincoat an older style of thick, heavy rubber, that wouldn't have been out of place in one of the old oil paintings of a lighthouse keeper braving the waves. She was excitedly staring at the sky, letting the rain fall down, pooling on and running through her hair. When she heard the character walking up the street, she stopped and stared at them as they walked by, not seemingly bothered by the rain pouring off her face or the unwritten rules that one should not take notice of others when out and about. The character subconsciously picked up their pace, but the young lady was faster. She leapt off her bin and rushed to the character, grabbing them by the hand and stopping them in the street. The character made to shake her off and continue on their way, but something stopped them. Just stop. You have to see this. The character turned to look at the young woman, who turned her head and wouldn't meet the character's eyes, but instead she pointed up at the sky. The character stopped and followed her finger. They could only see the rain and shiny reflections of the glass buildings reflecting each other in the lights of advertisements. What am I supposed to be seeing? Just look. The rain. Isn't it beautiful? It's so calm and cool. And the way the clouds swirl and roll. Did you know that clouds are actually liquid water condensed and suspended in the air? The character looked again, trying to make out the rolling clouds beyond the tops of the buildings, and trying to see what she was trying to show them. But then the note from the book came back to them like a haunting vision. Could this be what the note meant? She certainly wanted their attention, and she wouldn't meet their eyes. She seemed to know when they were looking at her, and would shift to obscure her face. Could she be one of them? The character subtly counted her fingers in their hand while she excitedly gestured to the rain and talked to them about how raindrops form. Four fingers and a thumb. One of the fingers was missing everything beyond the second digit. Could that be the danger? Whatever teeth. They stole a glance. She seemed to be missing a few. Maybe that is what the letter meant. They didn't know how many teeth a person was supposed to have. With each further detail, their brain started to run away with them, constructing villainous intent to her explanations of how raindrops were shaped by water tension. This must be what the letter was talking about, and therefore they must be in danger. Look, I really don't care. I have to go home. Goodbye. The character shook her off and set off at a brisk walk down the street and turned a corner, stopping just out of sight to catch their breath and calm their racing thoughts. They took a cautious glance around the corner again before they left. The woman was standing in the middle of the street where they had left her. She seemed emotionally deflated. She held out her hand and watched the rain pool in it and overflow before she collapsed into a slump in the puddle. Her cries started as they cut with some heavy breathing and grew into shaky sobs. She was no fairy. She was merely a person, albeit an odd one with intense interests who wanted someone to share them with someone to care. Leave. Fuck off, you. Haven't you done enough? Do you need to watch my pain, too? She called out between sobs. The character made haste away and then guiltily set off for home. They had restless dreams that night. They heard mysterious voices asking for their soul, and they heard the woman's shaking words rattle around their head in a ceaseless guilty spiral. Sometimes they would be walking amidst the twisting forests, running into fairy rings, and other times they'd be back in the beanbag, turning over the letter through and through their fingers. Hello, can I get your attention to show you the wonders of Clarinol? The voice had a melodious feminine pitch, almost too feminine, 
And something was off-putting about its cadence, too. Just another goddamn advertiser trying to sell me something, the character thought, as they made the usual to pull away and continue to work, with the sinking tread creeping and clutching at their mind, some ancient circuit of their consciousness telling them to pay attention for they were in danger. That was not human. They were not immune. They paid attention. The thing seemed human if one let it slip past their vision, giving it the fragments of scraps of attention that one gave all advertisements. But it was wrong in many ways that they were hard to place. When looking directly at it, it seemed to resist being questioned and detailed. What size was it altogether too large for the space it took up? But its skin was so smooth and white. Its hair was luscious and detailed, flowing elegantly. If one tried to look around it, it seemed as though it was just off from the world around it. It wasn't standing or part of the world as much as it was pretending to do so and trying to give the appearance of existing without knowing truly what it meant to stand on level ground. And if one looked at her jewelry, it was immensely detailed, but it was just visual noise. One's eyes tended to slide off of it, saying, I know what that is, that's just a face, or that's clearly a hairband. But was it really? Were those overly detailed details actually represent? What did they actually represent? Why were its flyaway strands truly disconnected and giving the texture of hair but simply being part of empty space? The character remembered the note and pushed themselves to pay attention to details and count what this thing was and nail its form down to something, anything really. Did you know that Clarinol is highly recommended by 68% of dermatologists? Its words ensnared the character with the sticky artificial attempts at genuineness that one may find at the smell of rat poison. It was sweet, sure, but could you really say it was sweet? How many fingers? One, two, three, four. No, that's not a finger. What was that? Five? Six? All long, gangly things with two sharp of angles intersecting at wrong places. They gave the impression of fingers, but weren't actually. How many teeth? At first, things seemed normal when one focused their brain to take hold of something. There were too many, too close together, all perfectly ordinary, all freshly whitened and shiny. That's a mouth. No, people aren't supposed to have six teeth there in that part. It was a thing that resisted categorization, resisted being understood. One's mind slid off and around it, seemingly getting bored without being able to leave and resisting any attempts to see how wrong it actually was. Strange, given its purpose to garner attention. Here, try some. I'll put it on you. Just remember to talk to your doctor about Clarinol. Its touch felt like soft hands, rubbing cold cream into the back of the character's hands. Or did it? No. What did it feel like? That sanitized image too perfect and ingrained in the character's mind from glimpses and attention paid in advertisements for sheets and other things was all that could come to mind. Something so fake and unreal, yet that being the only way the brain could process what this truly was. You fucker, leave! the coarse wet touch of a glove to their other hand, and together, too cold, too real, too overstimulating all at once, combined with the real voice that felt too low and masculine now in comparison to the perfect ineffability of the thing. It was the young woman from the previous day grabbing the character and pulling them away from its insidious grasp. She drew them back into the crowd, pulling them along, back into the crowds and surges of people trying to board the subway for work, back into the overwhelming noise. Notice those things. Recognize it, but do not pay attention, for attention must be paid. You will not win. You will only persist and survive as much as possible. You cannot win, the young woman said urgently. She refused to look at the character, but it was comforting, as she did not want the character's attention, unlike that thing which refused to let them look away. I'm, I'm sorry about, about yesterday, the character mumbled, 
letting the familiar rumble of the subway bring them back into reality and remember the events of the last day. You are an ass and a bastard. Your feelings are your problem to deal with. You don't get to just get taken by those things. But next time, you save yourself. The young lady got up and shuddering with the subway and left the doors behind her. As the character carried on their way to work, trying to mull over the events that had happened, they subconsciously rubbed the smooth, supple, hairless patch on the back of their hand and found themselves wondering if they could get their boss to stock Clarinol. It really rather was nice stuff. Well, that concludes today's collection showcase. I hope you can find enjoyment in perusing the other works here we have at the Disquiet Library. Please remember, if you want to commission new works to be added to the library or your own personal collections, we can be commissioned with the artistry link that can be found in the treats near the donations or in the description box or card with your audio recording. Thank you, shadowy wanderers of the night, and have a wonderful evening.